Hey, so my name is uh, is Rakesh, uh, and this is you know like ten times the audience I expected for this talk, but that's that's a good thing. Um, uh, I, I work on this little app, you know. So I quit my job like a couple of months ago, and I've been I've been uh, uh, trying to build something for the JavaScript community, uh, and obviously trying to make a little buck on the side while I'm doing that. Uh, so one of the apps that I built while doing this was this uh, app for. Uh, Oh. All right. So I quit my job a couple of months ago to start working on on uh, on, on building tools for for JavaScript and, and uh, you know, stuff around that. One of the tools that I've been working on over the last couple of months is this tool called Errorception. Um, it's a tool that lets people record errors in their uh, in their pages as they happen in end users' browser. Right? Uh, it's generally, data that is lost uh, because it gets printed in. in Console, which is a stupid place to get printed at because you never get access to it. Jason has been using it, so I don't know if he has any feedback about it. Um, but, but that said, uh, uh, it's an interesting place. So I, I don't want to make this a product pitch. The idea is that, the idea is that occasionally uh, there, are, there are services that. Where is the. There are speakers, do you know, so I don't interfere with them? <laughs> no idea. All right. Uh, so, so you know, the way it works is that I give you a little snippet of, of code to insert into your pages, um, and then this starts recording errors. So let's not get into the details about how that works. The, the interesting bit over here is that that I give you a snippet of code to insert. Right? This is very similar to how, say, Google Analytics works, or uh, or how uh, you know Kissmetrics works, or how uh, you know even Discuss or, or other forms of. Uh, of other uh, of, of plugins that you add to your code works now. Uh, this talk is meant to from uh, this talk is meant to give you an idea of the of the knowledge that I got when building a snippet like this because it turns out that it's uh, it's it's a wild uh, it's a wild world out there where where you can never trust what kind of page in what time and environment you're running in. So so this talk is about the lessons that I learned uh, in the process of doing that. Right. Um, right, so it's, it's basically about the lessons learned when I was creating uh, Errorception itself. Uh, I spoke already briefly about Errorception. Uh, so these are these are examples that I studied uh, in the process of trying to create uh, third, this, this snippet that I was talking about. So there's Google Analytics, Kiss Metrics, Discuss, Facebook, Twitter, you know, there's a whole, whole uh, thousands literally uh, of examples of third party JavaScript. Um, so I, I did a series of blog posts about this that recently uh, happened to get a lot of uh, uh, JavaScript press, so to say. It was, if people are subscribing to magazines like JavaScript Weekly and stuff, this was published over there. Um, Smashing Magazine, you know, a bunch of places that we got press. Um, so so it, was, it was three. It was broken down into three posts. The, so I've sort of stuck to that format over here. Uh, so this is this from the first post uh, where I called it the first rule of writing third-party JavaScript. So. Three, three parts. We go over the first one really quickly because I guess most most of us will be familiar with the first with the first post, so to say. The second and the third we'll dive into in some amount of detail. Um, so, uh, how many are here uh, familiar with the movie Fight Club? Right. The first rule of Fight Club is don't talk about Fight Club. Right. So the first the first rule of third party JavaScript though is that you do not own the page. Now this doesn't sound as interesting as standard <laughs> learning, but but you do not own the page. Right. That's the first rule of, of JavaScript of, of third party JavaScript. This has got a lot of implications. Uh, so the first one is that when you insert your code, when you ask somebody to insert your code into the page, the impact of that should be minimal. There should be very little impact of that. And we'll discuss what that means. And secondly, that you cannot make any assumptions about the page. You cannot make any assumptions about the environment that your code is running into. And we'll discuss what that means as well. So uh, uh, one way of ensuring that you have minimal impact, uh, and there are at least two or three of them, but one of them is that you should not have any globals at all. right? Uh, so uh, there is this idea of immediately invoked anonymous functions. I'm sure most of you know about this. Where you have a function function block that you invoke immediately. Uh, this essentially creates a, a, a scope a trap, so to say, for your variables. And since your variables are, are inside this uh, scope trap, you are not leaking into the global scope, right? So, so uh, a, a simple example of how how not to create globals. Uh, a slight improvement over this is where uh, you take in window and document 
uh, as parameters, uh, you're taking them back into, into the function. The benefit of doing this is that when you run this through a minifier in the future, right, your, your, your variables become some, something really small like A and B, right? So even though you're thinking that you're accessing global variables, you're actually accessing local variables now. So your, basically your code can, can shrink slightly when you run it through a minifier. So window.whatever will become a.whatever and so on, right? So uh, slight, slight sort of uh, improvement on your code. This can, you know this already, this can be applied to general JavaScript as well. So you know, it's, it's, it's a benefit that you get anyway. Uh, now I say no globals, of course, it's useless if you have code that does not expose a variable at all. Uh, you know, what is your namespace variable, right? How do you, how do you work with this code? Uh, so you have to have one global, let's be fair, right? Uh, uh, so if you look at look at what other guys are doing, Google Analytics has got underscore GAQ as, as their variable. I'm sure uh, if you work on the front end, everybody's worked with Google Analytics, so you know what I'm talking about. So underscore GAQ is there. Facebook uses FB, Twitter has got TWPTR. Uh, Airception, you know, I'm punching that. You see what I did here? I'm, I'm punching that with the rest. Airception has got underscore ERRS, right? Which is, which is their global variable. Uh, Another impact of, uh, another uh, sort of uh, fallout of not having any uh, uh, global impact whatsoever is that it should not mess with shared objects. Shared objects like strings, numbers, arrays, objects, don't, don't mess with these. Don't add to string.prototype, right? Don't add left pad or whatever. Don't do that kind of stuff, right? That's, that's not a good idea. Uh, so never mess with shared objects. Uh, do not do DOM modifications. People don't like it if their DOM changes. There are two exceptions, of course. The first is when you are expected to do a DOM modification, of course. Like, for example, when you're adding a Facebook widget, right, you're expected to do a DOM modification. Uh, in that case, it's fine. But I would say that the way you do that is by taking in uh, the DOM node that you want to operate on. Uh, so, so you're setting an expectation that the developer is, is passing you a DOM node within which you're supposed to play. So, you know, the developer knows that I'm not going to own that anymore. That's yours. You know, you play with that. So that's one case where it's okay to play with the DOM. And the second case where it's okay to play with the DOM, is this is hacky, uh, is when you want to do cross-domain communication back to your own server. Uh, now, ideally, you should not use the DOM for this. You should use uh, the cores spec, the cross-origin resource sharing spec. Uh, but, you know, reality is that it's not supported in, in most, uh, in older browsers at least. So uh, the way you deal with it is by you know, doing stupid hacks like creating an image which has got a query string that is talking to your server or, or you know, passing data over to your server. Or, uh, you know, using JSONP or something that, that is, you know, creating a script tag locally. Or even dirtier is using iframes or things like that so that you can, you know, plot data into your page directly. So there are, there are the only cases where you can, there's no way out other than using the DOM to communicate across, the, across domains in this case. So that's the only case where, uh, you know, you can still use the DOM. Well, meanwhile, let's keep this interactive. If you have any questions and all that, feel free to fire anytime, right? Um, <coughs> yeah, so that was about about uh, not not messing with the page at all. This one's about not making assumptions at all about the page. Uh, for example, you know, does document dot head exist? Uh, so a lot of times, what people do is that they append stuff to the document to the to the page when they want to, right? So you want to add a script tag to the page, you append it to document dot head. Can you trust that document.head always exists? Turns out you can't. You know, you if you, you think that that when you have a, 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 a so there's an assumption that when you have a, a, that when the page is parsed and it's ready and the DOM is created, that there will be a head and a body to it, irrespective of whether the markup had a head and body in it or not. Right? Turns out that assumption cannot be made. There are older browsers. I think this Opera, uh, an older version of Opera, did not support document.head. If your DOM did not have document, if your HTML did not have document.head in it, right? So you cannot even trust simple things like this. Uh, another example is if you use the base tag, uh, what is what is your paths relative to? That becomes a, a complicated question to answer. So you know these are these are kind of things that people generally take for granted when we are writing code in our own pages. Uh, but you cannot make these assumptions when you are writing code for the wild. Um, Quickly moving, so that, that's basically the, the basics of, of what needs to be taken care of, right? Don't mess with the page, uh, don't give surprises to anyone, and don't make any assumptions about what's going on. Uh, we'll move on very quickly, this is slightly more interesting, and the third part is even more interesting, is, uh, is about how to load your code. Uh, there, are, there are considerations that, that you need to keep, take care of is uh, eliminate any network performance effects. 
which is to say that just by virtue of adding your code, the page should not slow down, right? That's something you should take care of. And the second is that uh, what happens in case your your servers go down? Uh, so you know, let's say that let's say that Jason is using uh, Airception, and Airception servers go down. Now, does that mean that his site is going to be impacted by this? You know, it's not something I don't want to take on the responsibility of having damaged his site uh, just because my servers went down. So I have to take care of that in my code. I don't, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to sign a, a license agreement with him that will, that will sort of keep me safe from this. I want to take care of this and impose that in code, right? So, so how do I take care of that? Right? So number one is do not use a script tag. Uh, we all know this. Steve Sauter has been standing on rooftops and shouting. Do not use a script tag. Uh, it blocks your page rendering. It blocks your your network requests that go out. We know about this. There's no need harping on. Um, but Twitter does this. I don't know why Twitter does this. It's the stupidest thing. But Twitter does this uh, for their uh, at anywhere SDK, right? Uh, so uh, uh, what I'm talking about though is not about just. Eliminating, I'm not talking about reducing the performance. Everyone knows how to reduce performance, right? right? You uh, use a caching, you do proper caching, you use a CDN, we, we know about all of that. That's not a problem. I'm talking about eliminating the performance. Right? The effect of adding your code should be literally zero. Uh, it should not be reduced to as close to zero as possible. It should be literally zero. Uh, so, you know, we'll talk about how we do that. Uh, anyone familiar with the async attribute in HTML5? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, so you would think that the async attribute and the async attribute is cool. For those who don't know, what it means is that when you create a script tag and you add async to it, uh, it means that your browser is now instructed that the browser should not block on loading that uh, code, uh, and instead the browser will continue passing the rest of the HTML as well. Uh, and this is this is good for two reasons. Because number one, you have not blocked the page. Uh, the network requests and two because you have not blocked page rendering so you know you get two benefits with using async uh, that's that's two birds with one stone that's awesome uh, the trouble is that that async is not supported in uh, in older browsers including uh, browsers up to ie9 ie 10 the betas that are out are showing support for async but i up, up till ie9 there is no support for async at all uh, and then there are older browsers as well, of course async is rather new, so there are older browsers as well that don't support uh, async, uh, including Firefox 2, I think Firefox 3 doesn't support async as well, um, so you know, something to watch out for. As a third party developer, I cannot trust async to work, I will, I will have to find another mechanism, because I cannot make assumptions about where end users are going to come from, which browsers they are going to come from, I need a better mechanism than using async. Um, so uh, one of the mechanisms Steve Souders uh, found this, and uh, and I think uh, it was Nicholas Zakis who basically created the script snippet here. Uh, he calls it the dynamic script tag creation technique, uh, where what you do is that you create a script tag. Is this visible behind? Is it okay? Right. So you create a script tag dynamically, and then you append that to the body, uh, and turns out this has the same effect as creating an async uh, attribute, right? So at this point, your browser is now not going to block on either network loading or on, on rendering. Uh, and your code is loaded you know, uh, parallelly. So this has the same effect as, as doing async loading. Uh, so you can now load your code using this mechanism rather than asking people. So now rather than asking people to add a script tag that is going to uh, you know, load your file from some, some external server, it's better that you give them a script tag that looks like this. Uh, and your, your external server's path is over here. Uh, and you're, you're basically creating the script tag, uh, you know, using using JavaScript itself. Um, there is this is very similar to Facebook. In fact, does exactly this. Uh, so Facebook's SDK, when you are when you are loading it up, that's exactly what they do. They create a JavaScript file and then they append that to the head, right? And and uh, uh, so that's exactly what Facebook does. Except we just discussed that you cannot trust that the head exists, right? I, it's, I don't know why Facebook still does this. It's common knowledge now. Google Analytics has done a minor improvement where document.body or document.head is not trusted. And so they append, this is an interesting approach. Uh, so uh, if you don't have head or if you don't have body, where do you append to? Right? Uh, turns out that one thing you can trust is that this script tag exists on the page. You can trust that, right? Because that's how your code is running, right? So you can trust that your script tag is there on the page. So you get a handle to a script tag, some script tag. It doesn't matter which script tag that is. But you know that for sure there's at least one script tag on the page. 
right? So you get a handle to some script tag, which is what they are doing here, right? So they're getting all the script tags, taking the first script tag, whichever that might be, it doesn't matter. And then to that parent, to the parent node of that, they are appending this. Forget about the detail about insert before, it doesn't matter. Yeah, go on. Uh, so the question is that even if the if the if the DOM is ill-formed, uh, doesn't the browser handle that? Uh, yes, they do in modern browsers. Turns out there are older browsers where uh, so for example, if you don't have a head tag in your HTML, the corresponding DOM the DOM that is created might not have the head element inside the DOM. This is this is the case in in Opera and some other older browsers. So uh, you know you have to account for that. Uh, so it's just better that you can trust, you know that you can trust yourself, right? So the script tag that you have created definitely exists. So you try to work around that to make sure that you can add your code. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, why, is, why would this be asynchronous? I still did, I could not get that. It's, it's, it's a browser work. The way the browsers work is that if you're creating JavaScript with JavaScript, if you're adding JavaScript with JavaScript, the browser treats it asynchronously. It's just the way the browsers are working. Uh, you know, it's, it's a hack that was discovered by C-Sound. Is it irrespective of the async attribute in the GA or you know, for the script tag being set to true? Uh, yes, it is irrespective. So, so this is actually unnecessary in, in uh, all. So I, on my blog post, I had, I had said that I don't know why people do this. Uh, it turns out Steve Sauders came to my blog to correct me and, and explain why this works. And the reason it works is because uh, in older browsers, uh, I think Firefox 3 and older, um, the async equal to true is actually needed to ensure that it is async. Uh, so, you know, uh, all, all newer browsers since then, uh, and all the IEs and all the other browsers, I think it's specific to Firefox 3, that you need to have async equal to true to ensure that it is, it is properly asynchronous, right? Right? Moving on. Um, so my next question was, and this plays into the idea about uh, if my servers go down, does that affect the site? Uh, if, let us say that, that uh, for whatever reason, my code takes say 10 seconds to load, right? Is the onload of of the end user's uh, page going to be blocked? Uh, because if it is, then that's horrible. Uh, you know, just because my script is taking long, I don't want that guy's code to be affected. Uh, so I had to run quick tests to find out whether whether you know it's actually the way it works. Turns out uh, we can't be sure. You know, like everything in, in client side development, you never know. Uh, so in some older browsers, it is blocked. Uh, newer versions of browsers, uh, the async is actually async and has nothing to do with the onload. Uh, it in fact even varies with browser versions. So if you look at Chrome, older versions of Chrome, like 12 and 13, I think, uh, they used to block onload even if you gave async. Uh, whereas newer versions of Chrome do not block onload if you uh, whether when you give async. So you know there's a difference in behavior across across browsers and browser versions as well. Uh, so, so this is something that I do not want to trust. So basically, if my if my code goes slower, depending on which browser the end user is using, the site might get uh, might have a bad experience. Right? I, I don't I don't want to depend on that. So uh, I found a solution here, slightly more convoluted code. Uh, but what I'm doing is uh, this is this is this is a loader function right here that I've created that does what we have been discussing so far, where it creates a script tag and appends that to the page. Except I'm calling this loader function only after page load is actually completed, right? So what is happening now is that I'm explicitly waiting for the page load to complete. And only then am I adding my script tag. The benefit is, so this gives me two benefits, right? I, I did not even consider this when I was building it, but it turned out that, I, that these, are, these are solid benefits. Number one, uh, if my server is down, it does not affect the site at all because his regular page load cycle is already complete on the page before my code is even involved in the process, right? Number two, uh, and this was this was quite a pleasant surprise, is that the entire bandwidth that the end user has is available to finish loading up his resources first. And only after his resources are complete do uh, does my code start jumping into the picture. Uh, now this might look like a small, like minor thing, and it is actually on, on, on computers that have got fat, fat pipes connecting them. But on, on computers that have got, you know, like maybe mobile phones, right, where you have got uh, uh, bandwidth related problems, uh, if I can load my code as late as possible, that gives immense benefit uh, uh, as opposed to loading my code parallelly along with the other code, right? Where I'm consuming bandwidth uh, simultaneously. So, so that's one benefit. Admittedly, this is not this is not for everyone because um, obviously, for example, if you if if you have Facebook, 
uh, or if you're using Facebook on your page, you want the SDK to be loaded as quickly as possible so that you can start playing with it. Uh, in my case, that is not a, that is not the case because you're not going to play with the errorception object. Uh, you know, ideally, ideally, errorception should not even be in the picture because because ideally your sites don't have errors in them, right? So, uh, <laughs> so, so, uh, uh, so you don't want to. So, errorception is is sort of basically stepping out of the process completely and letting you uh, do what you want, letting you do letting you do what your uh, site is supposed to do, so that you don't have to interact with the object at all. I can add this code to Google Analytics too, so that my uh, my browser, uh, like my code, loads first. In my when I'm sure. using Google Analytics, I can use this. Sure, sure, sure. So if if you're uh, uh, you know uh, courageous enough to to play with the Google Analytics loader code itself, you can you can try this for sure. Okay. Uh, I'll in fact put up these presentations, this, these slides for you, so if you want to give it a shot. Uh, so, but the only real difference you will get is that Google Analytics loads parallelly. Uh, error reception in this case loads later, so you know it's 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 that minor difference that you get. Um, so yeah, I I I've already spoke about this. The, the first benefit is that I'm stepping out of the page load process completely, letting the site load as usual. Uh, and secondly, that I'm allowing the full bandwidth of the user to load up the page, and I'm not consuming any of that bandwidth while the page is loading. So essentially, I have prioritized the page resources over my own code, uh, which is good. Which means that. And this philosophically works fine with me because I, I don't want uh, a philosophical stand that I was taking when building a reception is that I'm not going to affect your page load in any way whatsoever. Me being a JavaScript programmer, I know that that is important to me when I'm building JavaScript apps. That just because I've included some third party, something that I'm not in control of, I don't want that to start playing with my page load process. I don't want that to start affecting my page performance. So so this was a philosophical stand I took and, and it plays in very well with that. Uh, also, uh, in case my code does not load, for whatever reason, it has absolutely no impact whatsoever. So you know that's that's great because that that second the script pack that is to be appended will not work, and that's fine. You know, there's there's no effect whatsoever. Right. So that wraps up part two. Uh, part three. This is this is this is very interesting. Is planning for an API. This was this was uh, a revelation for me because it, it made things uh, uh, very uh, mind blowing factual. Okay. So uh, so the, the biggest challenge here is. How do you announce that you are ready, right? If you're if you're planning for an API, you want to make an object available to people, and you know people are going to play with that object. Now, how do you make that object available to people? How do you announce that an object is ready to play with? Uh, now, if you take the case of Twitter, it's rather simple because they've got a script tag. You include the script. Uh, it's a blocking call, so as soon as the script is done, you have the Twitter object to play with, right? Simple. Uh, except we have discussed that this is a horrible, horrible idea, right? Because you're blocking. Uh, we are talking about asynchronous loading instead. So uh, there are several mechanisms. One is that we can use script dot onload script tags. Since we are creating them dynamically, have got an onload uh, uh, sort of event uh, event on them. So you can have an onload. You can have a listener assigned to onload that will be fired when the script tag is loaded. Uh, but that has got edge cases. Now, what if your script tag four not force? How will onload fire? Will that fire by saying that yes, onload is done, but I have got an unpassable page? You know, you have to handle that. <coughs> uh, secondly, and honestly, from experience, you do not want to have too much code inside that snippet that you are passing on to the person for two reasons. One is that it's a, it's a lot of code. You don't want that guy to be copy pasting a lot of code into his page. Secondly, you want to have a lot of control over that code yourself because if there are bugs, the more code you have, the more bugs there are. Right? You want to keep that code size to a minimum. Uh, and if there are going to be bugs, you would rather have them at a place where you can control deployments later. Now, if I have asked somebody to copy paste this snippet onto their site, uh, I have no control over that once it's been copy pasted. So, if I have to do maintenance on that, it's going to be very difficult. So, I'd rather keep that chunk as low as possible and try to keep as much code at my end as possible, right? So, I didn't want to have script dot onload and all of that logic sitting over there, which are, you know, uh, so what are the options that are available to make this even smoother? Um, what Facebook does is interesting, and this was the first cue for me, is that they, they ask you to define this function called FB async init. Uh, horrible name, but, but forget about that. So uh, the point is that you define this function, and Facebook tells you that whenever we are ready, we'll call this function. right? And so inside this function now, uh, you will have a global FB object that we guarantee will be ready for you to play with. right? And then they go ahead and they load their code asynchronously as they used to anyway. So the benefit over here now 
is that so so the way this works is that when the code loads uh, it will have defined an FB object and you know all the paraphernalia that goes on with that and then they will say that if you have got FB async in it defined in the page that's what the code does right and I could have shown you that snippet but I don't have that over here but there are said if window.fb async in it and if the type of that is a function then invoke the function that's it right uh, so it's it's so the guarantee now that the FB event will be there's another benefit of this is that in case the Facebook script does not load, uh, FB async unit will never be called. Uh, and, and that's great. That means that your code will not get initialized, the user does not see anything. The user will, you know, instinctively hit refresh and it'll just work. Bad experience, but at least you know things don't get uh, there are no errors that happen uh, simply because of timing issues, right? Uh, now this is this is brilliant, this is awesome. Uh, I just outline the process for this in case you're interested. So step one is ask the developer of the page to define a global function, call it whatever you want. Facebook calls it FBA sync in it. Uh, second is that you start loading your code, which is the rest of the snippet that I had shown over there. And then finally call the function that you had defined, that you had asked the developer to define before, right? From inside your code. So this is this is one way of doing it. Uh, now there are there are write-only APIs. This is a special case, and this is the interesting bit. There are most of the terms of most of third most of third-party snippets that people use are actually invisible snippets that are that are writing to their services. Right? These are trackers. These are uh, loggers. These are apps like that. Reception is one of them. Uh, so there are write-only APIs. Write-only APIs have this uh, uh, interesting nature where generally you are not using the object yourself, or if you are. You're basically just asking it what to write. Like, for example, in Google Analytics, you're telling it track this event or you know do whatever you know things like that. You are you're basically writing to it. You're not expecting data back. Uh, now, if you're not going to expect data back, turns out you don't even have to have a Google object to play with, right? Uh, and I'll show you how this works. And this is very very interesting. Um, so look at this. This is like how there is the FB object. This is similar to that, the underscore GAQ uh, uh, object, which is the Google uh, Analytics Q. That, I think that's what GAQ stands for. They have never spoken about this anywhere. But I think that's what it stands for. Google Analytics Q is basically an array. It's not even an object, right? It's just an array. Now, to this array, you are keeping on pushing what looks like command, right? So you're saying set account, and you're passing it your account ID. You're saying track page view. You're saying you know track event, and so on. You're basically just pushing commands into a queue, right? And at any point, you can continue doing this. At any point of time in your code, you can continue adding stuff into this queue, and it doesn't matter. Uh, at some point in the future, whenever the Google code is loaded, they will start processing this queue, right? As far as you as a developer is concerned, you continue to write to this queue whenever you have anything to write, and Google will keep reading from that queue and keep and keep sending instructions to their server, right? Uh, the benefit of this is that there is no question about now waiting for when it will be loaded. Is there a global function that has to be defined that I have to call? None of that business, right? You're just writing to a queue, and then later that queue is flushed, right? So uh, this is very similar to what reception does as well. Reception is also defined a queue because we are right on the API as well. You know, there's nothing to read from from the service. We basically every time there's an error, go write that error to the server, right? That's all that we're doing. So what we're doing is that there's a queue, and then we're keeping on pushing errors to that queue, and uh, and we start loading our JavaScript. At some point in the future, the JavaScript will load, and you know, whenever it loads, that's fine, and you know, it will start processing that queue, uh, and that's how error reception works, right? Um, now there are tricks to this. Uh, what I do, for example, is after the code has loaded, I change this array into an object that has got only one method on it called dot push, right? And the reason why I do that is because now I don't have to poll the queue to know if there were any changes. The moment, the moment there is something pushed to the queue, I can instantly uh, find out that there was a push that was done, and then I can, you know, buffer that up and send it up. Right. So uh, uh, there are tricks that you can do. This Google Analytics does this as well. Uh, if you look at their minified code, which which requires a lot of, uh, you know, it peels your eyes to look at their code because it's so minified. But if you ever have the, uh, if you ever end up having the patience to do that, uh, they do the same thing in the GAQ case as well. Is they convert the array to an object with one method called dot push on it. Right. Uh, so uh, obviously this whole thing was driving up to a pitch. So I, you know, I make the pitch really quick on one slide. Uh, is that a reception is uh, is high performance by design because of the reasons we discussed, and it is highly reliable by design because even if our so reliable is a, is a funky word because what I mean is that in case our servers go down, it does not affect you. That's what I mean by reliable, right? So so it's highly reliable by design. 
uh, and and that's error exception for you. Catches errors for you. We've got over over five billion errors so far in major internet brands already, uh, and I uh, I urge you to give it a look. Uh, that's it. Give it a spin. Errorception.com. Uh, my Twitter handle is at errorception. If if you ever want to give it a shot, uh, thanks a lot. Thank you. I have to say this audience is far larger than I expected. I don't expect to be this big. Go ahead. Yes. I'm sorry, I can barely hear you. Right. Race condition of what sort? You will not have that race condition because JavaScript is single thread. There's only one thread. So at, at any point you are either writing to the queue, sorry, so I'll repeat the question for the sake of the camera, is that will there be a race condition in between when the code has loaded and, and when there are being items being pushed into the queue? Uh, no, no, there will not be because JavaScript is a single thread. So there is either writing going on or there is processing going on. You cannot have both happening parallelly. So there is no question of a race condition as far as that queue is concerned. Any other questions? Does, does that answer the question? Oh. Yeah. Go ahead. Sure. Uh, is this the one you were talking about? Yes. Or the loading? I had two slides on Facebook. The uh, asynchronous. Uh, the yeah, loading. This one. This one. All right. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, so this is basically where there is uh, the developer is asked to create a global function called FB async init. FB async init. Uh, and this is just a global function that's available on the page. Later, when the code loads, inside of the Facebook's SDK code, which is fb.js or whatever, <coughs> inside of that code, they are checking if there is this global function called fb async in it uh, defined. And if it is, they just invoke it. The point is that at this point, at this point, fb.js or whatever is their code has definitely created the fb object. We are sure that the fb object exists. So when this function is called, fb is, is definitely ready for use. Uh, before this function is called, it is not, uh, because because the code has not loaded yet. But once this function has been called, we are sure. So this is basically, it's like it's like, it's like like an on ready for the FB async, for, for the Facebook code, right? So that's how it works. Why should not you modify the set object you said there? Sorry, why should you not modify? Set object, like uh, string or prototype or... Oh, that's, uh, that's standard JavaScript practice, right? You're living in a, in a runtime that is shared across uh, a lot of people. What if I have defined a function, or what if you have defined a function that's called uh, pad left, but it has got a different signature from my pad left function, right? You should never, like I, you should never, I should not have to change code that is inside your environment, uh, because I don't know what you are expecting to do with it. You know what I mean? That's not, not clear. Actually, but sometimes we need to reveal the, uh, reveal the method in prototypes, like, General, suppose I'm uh, making some regular reference that should be available to all strings. Right. Then I should, I must have to write that regular expression in string dot some expression function. Right, right. So there is a lot of debate about whether you should be modifying prototypes at all or not. I guess there are valid cases. So let us say that you decide to change string dot prototype to have some validation method on it, right? For example, is email, right? You have a string dot is email. Uh, it's debatable whether that's a good idea or not, but let's say you decide to do that. Now, if you're doing that, and if I start to define an is email on the same string method, uh, which one is correct? You know, it might be different from your implementation. Uh, you know, sh do I have the, do I even have the right to do that to your code, right? It's your runtime. Do I even have the right to add an is email to your string implementation, right? I should not be doing that. So, uh, that's why there's no modifications allowed to shared objects. Aditya smiling there is <laughs> any, any more questions? All right. Either, no, either everybody uh, understood or nobody understood. One good news for you is that it uh, has changed the way they indicate the button now. We just switched uh -huh. to the async mode just a few days ago, you know, like. Is it? Yeah. So now they normally use that one line tag to give the person. This must be true for the button. Uh, for the button, yeah. Right. Even even as of yesterday, I was looking at the at anywhere SDK, which is which is their entire API set. Right. right. Uh, and that is still uh, forcing a synchronous loading. But you might be right about the button, the the, the tweet button you're talking about, right?
Yeah, that may be a single reason. But was there really a reason for them to keep it that way? You know, because they claim that it has something to do with OAuth authentication and the experience associated with that. I don't buy it. it doesn't make sense. <laughs> It was not just that, even the add this button, they also don't use OSYNC, they just give you a script tag, you know? Yeah. I mean, I can imagine it, it just, it kills page performance. I, it's not something that I would, I would do at all. I, I don't like third parties doing that to my code, there's no way I would do that. Because I, I believe it's something to do with the way they modify the DOM, yeah? Because there's, there's no reason why add this and Twitter button to both just keep on script tag, yeah? Because back then when I built, you know, I was building a similar button, right? So I inspected both these codes, yeah? Right. And I had the Google option, but you know, I was in the end, I got a little scared and just took the straight approach and gave it to all my clients, yeah? Mm -hmm. So I also want to know why am I still doing this, you know? Is there... <coughs> yeah, no, I, I, there should not be any good reason to block uh, on, on script tag. Like, I mean, if if you're still doing that, I'll ask Team Saunders to talk to you. You know, change your mind. <laughs> but, but there's no reason for you to still do that. You should move away from that. Uh, people will love you more if you do that. <laughs> Is that it? So I guess either everybody understood or nobody understood. But, you know, <laughs> either of the two. Uh, catch me if you have any questions. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's, so at Interception, my personal Twitter is Rakesh314. My last name is Pi, so 3.14. Rakesh. Yeah, so. so. <laughs> Thanks.